Have your seat right up next to Molly. Look at is that. that um, who is that? Is that? We met last night. We met last. Hello, everybody, and all you online. Welcome to a fantastic presentation. Uh, we're real excited about this. We hope this will be uh, one of many we can bring to this community. Um, it's particularly exciting tonight, not only to have Bernard here, of course, but uh, we have the Richmond International Film Festival in town mm -hmm. right now, and we have some guests here from that, which is fantastic. So there's some people that ordinarily wouldn't be walking around the streets around here, but they've made it here tonight. We're really glad to have that. Um, this evening is about, uh, first of all, I'm Carlos Chafin, uh, and I'm associated with this place. Um, we have a lot of great people behind the scenes doing a lot of great stuff. Paul Bruski's going to be running sound and making sure everything is good. Andrea Buchheit is going to be running video, switching cameras and doing things like that, make sure that the live feed goes well. We've got a, uh, I'll let you introduce the situation in that happens. Uh, Jason Hall will be doing the sound and the which he's going to tell you more about. I'm not going to get into all that because I don't want to steal his thunder. Uh, and Kirk Schroeder, who's going to set that up. Kirk Schroeder and, uh, and Ashley Brooks uh, are both here. They are entertainment law representatives in this town. They do a lot of good work here. And um, as a result, uh, I've known Kirk for a long time. Yeah. And it's really good to see him yeah. here. I'm really excited about that. I think we're going to learn a lot. And I'm, and I'm hoping everybody gets into the question and answers and has some great questions for these guys. It's now or never, folks. Find out, get the lowdown. So without further ado, Kirk Schroeder. Great. Thanks, uh, Carlos. Everyone, a round of applause for Carlos and uh, to in your ear for uh, hosting uh, just further introduction, I'm uh, Kirk Schroeder. I'm an entertainment attorney uh, here in Richmond. I've been here. Uh, since uh, God knows when, and my law partner Ashley Brooks is somewhere in the back, but uh, we just want to thank uh, In Your Ear for having us. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to just say the memory of Robin Thompson, mm -hmm. and uh, what a great person and uh, co-owner here for many years, and we lost him uh, way too soon, but I have many uh, memories of uh, Robin Thompson, so I just want to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge uh, his memory. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about the business and uh, legal aspects of um, the music industry and have a longtime friend, and it's sort of like a, a homecoming, because when I started out as an entertainment attorney, uh, one of the first things I had to do was negotiate a management deal with uh, Bernard's company, and I remember, was it Miles? Yeah. I, I drove Miles Mile crazy. Uh, I drove him crazy, just demanding all sorts of things, and he was lecturing me about the music business and everything. And Bernard was the intermediary who would call me up and go, now, now, Kirk. <laughs> I've, I've, I've continued in that role. I'm a, uh, air traffic controller with a fire. Yeah, so Miles and I were butting heads, just left and right. Yeah. And uh, on the side, Bernard would call me. We finally uh, made the deal. But uh, that, he... That He's one of the right top there. songwriters in the in country music, and he's had his own uh, journey along the way. But uh, uh, Bernard Porter is a native of uh, Richmond, and uh, he's lived in Nashville. Uh, gosh, let's see, I'm trying to think. We were about, uh, what, 25, 20, 25 years ago? Is that at that least. long? At least. Yeah. Uh, when we were uh, walking around Nashville, uh, butting heads with uh, over a management uh, deal. But uh, Bernard is, uh, is a top executive in the Nashville uh, music community. He's the, um, his LinkedIn is too long to list, but he's uh, currently right now the chairman and CEO of the PCG Universal Group. And I'm just going to summarize, he's had his hands in all sorts of music deals, all sorts of management deals, all sorts of artist development deals and is um, incredibly, as well as, I guess, major sponsorships, major corporations uh, come to him for sponsorship uh, things. And um, he's continuing to always be on the cutting edge whenever I'm talking to uh, Bernard. So this is a opportunity. He doesn't know, I told him before, he didn't know anything I'm going to ask him tonight. So that we're going <laughs> to have a little bit of uh, fun. But uh, 
Everyone, give me a big round of applause for Bernard Porter, who's oh. come here all the way thank you. from a place called Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, we got to stop for a second. I think Carlos has got uh, something going on with the computer in there. I think he might okay. You may have to start all over again, that heartfelt. You were doing so well. <laughs> I was doing it. was just a warm-up. Just a warm-up. Ready? New friends. Yeah, new friends. At the festival? Yeah. It was at the opening night? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Do you have a film in the festival? We have music. Oh, music in the festival. Great. Yeah, a lot, a lot of synergies. They do some of the same things we're doing. It's, it's not a bad town for synergies. So. And just so everybody knows. company I'll bring in the deals you close them that's when I when I met Kurt there goes uh, the my commercial yeah. so uh, yeah. all right commercial. thank you for the uh, the uh, the plug um, all right so uh, I thought we would just uh, talk a little bit about uh, just various different uh, topics and just get your reaction, and then uh, hopefully we'll stimulate some, uh, some Q&A in our uh, 30 minutes. Um, let me just start off. Damn, the music business is tough. Would you agree? It, it is a jungle, and that's exactly the way you need to treat it. You're in the jungle, and if you don't know how to maneuver in the jungle, know where the lions hide, the snakes are, the quicksand... But there's also beautiful things in the jungle. There's beautiful flowers, there's beautiful plants, 
And that's why mentors are so important with what you do and experts that can guide you along the way so you survive in the jungle. I've been living in the jungle my entire life. I've been in, living in the jungle since I was 14 years old. I would say that really one of the, you know, our law firm does uh, film and TV and uh, theater and other things, but I would say when we have music deals, uh, they are some of the toughest uh, at, at times can be the sleaziest and most difficult uh, yeah. uh, deals to uh, deal with because there are a lot of uh, folks that prey on people and um, uh, just, you know, uh, go uh, uh, go from there. But I also think, uh, you know, technology has made all the difference. I mean, obviously, when you and I first met, there was a thing called an album. Yeah. And uh, and you didn't have, we, didn't, we weren't uploading uh, things up on uh, iTunes and uh, all those sort of things. And now... Uh, nowadays, um, we've gone from uh, 360 record deals to everybody that can just put their stuff up online in one way or the other. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, or what's, how's that affected your business? Well, it's a good thing if you're prepared for it and you're willing to do the work and roll up the sleeves and learn about it. Like, this what is the work? Fantastic thing. What, what work are we talking about? We're talking about the digital age where we went from a, a, a technically an analog product of albums that were selling for $16.99 mm -hmm. to a 99 cent. Mm -hmm. The business got crushed from sixteen ninety nine album to ninety nine cent or free. Or free. Mm -hmm. So this is why the labels started going into the only thing but, that made them survive was the movies division. Warner, the movie division. Sony, the technology or, division. Or going three sixteen, say I own the artist. Everything they had to. you did. Well, I, I'm not always uh, thrilled about uh, that, but. Um, let me ask you this. So nowadays, I'll have people uh, knock on my door, and they've had this you know, beautifully written uh, record contract. They've hired someone up in New York or Nashville or, uh, or L.A. And when I start asking them, well, what's your distribution? What are you doing? I mean, uh, they're putting stuff on iTunes. They're going to get stuff on Spotify. And I'm always tempted to say to my client, you know, you could do that. We don't have, why do we have to commit you to a, you know, one year, five options, seven option, uh, whatever an option is uh, these days, yep. a type of agreement. And um, I mean, how does, what is the model now for a record company and, and when you're looking at artist development? Well, the, um, a major record deal for an artist these days is very unlikely. It's such a small percentage of slots that are available. You know, through your distribution out there, DistroKid, Tootenhor, all of these things, you do have the ability to put that out in distribution. But the challenge is you've got 30,000 art singles a day that are going up on those platforms. Every day are 30,000 new records that you're competing with. If you don't have capital behind you, just like any other business, to promote in your marketing, to put your brand apart. We're gonna have a young man that we're gonna to add to the conversation that's been with me since he was 12 years old. I, I develop a lot of prodigies in the world. He started with me when he was 12. He was already in college at 12 years old. And now he's running a digital company for me. But we have developed that platform for artists now, and we just proved the point that we took an artist that was talented, we put that special sauce on her, with the digital marketing and, and programming, and now we have a record deal from Interscope Records. Now, is that gonna happen every time? No, it's not, okay? But at this time, it did, okay? So, you, 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 yes, you can do your own distribution, but if you don't have the financial resources to put behind the marketing and targeting and where you can get out on the road and support yourself and build audience share, then it's very difficult yeah. still. Yeah, it no, really I, I would agree. Uh, Ashley and I were on the phone with a, a client that uh, is in artist development, and, uh, you know, he's actually now budgeting stipends for artists, you know, yeah. to pay them. You know, to keep them going and make sure that they're, uh, in, in, you know, trying to, uh, you know, figure out what the economic uh, model is there. Um, so, so really, uh, these days, um, digital promotion, right? Yeah. Key. Yeah. How about touring? I mean, in that really the last, uh, in that before COVID, and now we're coming out of COVID, hopefully, uh, there's still money for artists that can that can tour, right? That can get up and play at some venue. Well, Would the, you agree with that? Or? Well, I do agree with that. The difference is when you're looking at a major label deal versus what you can do as an independent, unless you're uh, independently wealthy or you have an investor, is the label can put that money behind tour support and take you into markets, and they have the influence to go in and make a difference. So that's the advantage that the major label has. Yeah. The, no, I, and I'm really just talking about the revenue streams, but... Um, 
obviously not everyone gets a, a major record label, no, right? No, majority and do not. I know in your world you are always shooting for that. that not label. necessarily. So what does that look like, not necessarily? If let's say we don't have a major record label on the horizon, what, what are you doing? What, how's the artist we're, making their money? We're planning strategies within our Instagrowth programs, our YouTube marketing and targeting, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to feed that algorithm because now artists are making money from streaming revenue. Such okay. as YouTube, S of course. Spotify. Spotify, YouTube. YouTube. So, okay. uh, they're making, matter of fact, they're making millions of dollars. Some are making millions of dollars. Yeah. There's a guy that's on here right now that's one of my clients that makes lots of money on YouTube and streaming. What kind of, uh, what kind of hits uh, do you need on YouTube to start seeing money? What, what's a, is it a million? Is it half a million? What? Well, he can give you very specific details on how much money per million of views or mm -hmm. millions of streams. Like mm -hmm. we have a client by the name of Gail, and you will know her. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you and your mom, and your sister, and God. It's one of the biggest stream songs of our lifetime. It was a freak of nature. Why did that happen? It started on TikTok. She became a phenomenon on TikTok because of that song. Yeah. A YouTuber out of uh, South Korea got a hold of it and started using it on some of his platforms. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, Atlantic Records comes knocking. Signed her to Atlantic Records, which was her dream. Mm -hmm. I have video of her when she was 12 that says, I want to be signed to Atlantic Records, the same label as Aretha Franklin, yeah. because they're committed to the artists, Atlantic. She's in the best place she can be. The good news, the good news about Gail is the fact that she can back it up. She's not just a flash in the pan. She's not just somebody that came up with a nifty idea, and she did. But she's also got the goods, and she's only 17 years old. Yeah. But she has made quite a bit of money off having three billion streams yeah, on the, that Yeah, the song. digital presence is, is, is huge right now. Yeah, and that, it is. And it continues to grow. In, Look in, her in up, G-A-Y-L-E. Uh, um, any of you are touring? I just want to just... Check off the box on touring. I mean, is that? Do you see that these days still as a revenue stream for for Absol the non-major record label? Absolutely, arts? but you know, back in Carlos in my day, you know, I mean, we. I was we, in <laughs> kindergarten, I think, back then. Uh, yeah. I don't think <laughs> I mean, we, we had to get on the telephone bowls and put the posters up, and we had to get out there and work the audience and make them aware that we're coming back, rock yeah. and roll mentality. Yeah. And there's still some of that that has to be done. I mean, you have to follow up your fans, let them know you love them, you know, uh, be active on your social media. But, I don't like the fact that you guys have to be prolific yeah. on the digital platform. I wish but, you didn't have to, but you do. You are being judged by your numbers, yeah. okay? I don't care how good you are with your music. There are exceptions to the rule, but unless you've got, unless you can sow what I call proof of concept in your Instagram, your TikTok, your streaming, Mike Dungan, my buddy who's the chairman of Universal Records, got up at CRS and he said, when I sign an artist, you know, they're going to have to have significant streaming or I'm not signing them Absolutely. as an independent. Right. And once they get signed, if they come out of the box and they still, if they don't show streaming numbers, they're probably not going to be with me yeah. very long. But you're, you're doing streaming now, Carlos, right? You're, you've got the, right this the, well, no, but the sessions live, uh, the, yeah. the music sessions. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you're trying to build a market uh, uh, for that, to bring people in the studio as well as the entertainment uh, Value. So, uh, and I know uh, folks on Broadway, especially during the COVID, were doing uh, Zoom performances and things. You talking that. about Broadway in Nashville or New York? New York, Broadway. Yeah. 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 But um, so, okay. So, uh, what does a major record deal look like these days? Probably is it the same as no, it's not the big advances it used to be, unless you've got some type of significant impact out there. Like, uh, if you look at in the country, where uh, Zach Brown had already built a, a tremendous a following, following. Mm -hmm. he was already making money, and he was in a position that the label didn't sign him to a major deal. So, what he's making a killing, yeah. already. It just looked that expanded him outside of the Georgia Carolinas into the whole domestic United States, and that's why he did it. He was also in a position to make Universal Records give him his own imprint label where he could sign other artists. Yeah. What a beautiful thing. So uh, yeah. these days, not much of an advance, sort of an all-in budget, but even to produce a, uh, a, a, what, 12 tracks? Even the it, producer fees have gone down. Yeah. You know, one of my partners... Uh, Keith, what, what are you seeing? Like, no more four points, three points? No more than four. Yeah. No more than four. Yeah. Okay. 
But even even with my like one of my partners, Keith Thomas. I mean, there was there was a time he was on retainer for Sony for a million a year, a million a year, and that was just to keep him where they could have him. You know, plus he was making seventy five to twelve thousand dollars a song as a producer. Those days are gone yeah. unless you're, you know, somebody that's the flavor of the week as a producer and you can command that. Yeah. You know, we, Molly and I were talking about Max Martin because she was saying we were listening to Britney Spears and, you know, the kind of the evolution of Britney Spears in a way that that production was so unbelievable. And she said, who did that? I said, that was Max Martin. Yeah. I mean, and Mutt Lang is another example. Those guys were perfection, almost overly protection, uh, perfection. Uh, Mutt Lang had an, uh, a clause in his contract. If he didn't like anything about the record, he could change it at any time up until the point it was manufactured. And one time with Shania Twain, there was just a little quirk on something. Nobody would ever have noticed but him. And they had to destroy like 80,000 records because he wanted it fixed. Yeah. He was that that's, yeah, well, precise. And that's in a whole other story, Mutt and uh, Shania. Yeah. So, uh, but, um, all right, so uh, Advance, so I'm just talking about what a major record deal looks like uh, today. Still uh, locked in on options, but I guess essentially if the first uh, the, album goes well, then you're renegotiating. I mean, it's, it's really just to get in the door and you, set your you, mark you, and do well, and then you come back, and if there's traction. You know, if you don't have any proof of concept or you're not in a position where you're already generating enough income to say no to the label, then they're they're going to be in a, a pole position with you, and your 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 focus has to be to build it to make yourself so valuable that you can go in and renegotiate, just like Garth Brooks did. Garth Brooks became so powerful that he actually went in and renegotiated and said, "I'm going to own my master recordings." Yeah, and he got it. Think about that. I, 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 from the label, yeah. you know, that there's a, after a period of time, I'm going to own it. I'm going to get it back. Yeah. That's power. That's very unusual. A, a very important point. Um, uh, I was in a negotiation uh, last week, and I was um, w on the other side was an attorney, and I could tell she didn't know much about the entertainment business, and so she was arguing over uh, what was a really great opportunity for her client, and I'm I'm almost certain that it was uh, her daughter, because uh, you know I, I just the way uh, you just you know kind of pick up on things, and at some point I just had to tell her, I said, look. Just do really well, and I'm sure if you come back after you know proving the concept, you can renegotiate. Yeah. I don't know if I'd cross the line in saying that, but it was just mainly just to get her over, get the your foot in the door, and yeah. get your foot in the door, and uh, and go from there. How about um, songwriting? Is Let me what? close the chapter on yeah, that, just so everybody understands. The uh -huh. the uh, the recording contract and beginning of your relationship is really a loss leader. The record is a loss leader as a marketing item for you to do two things: to tour and make money, to sell merchandise and make money. That's how you will make your living on the road. That that record is playing out in the world. It's building your brand. People are. There's a cause and a demand for you to go into those markets, make money, and make your merch. And in the current day, that manager and that record uh, uh, company are going to get a piece of that too. Yeah, and I'm going to say if you're the manager and you, your artist uh, goes to a major label and you're a uh, dead man walking because they want a new manager uh, for you at the label, make sure your sunset clause yeah. is three to five years out, not two years out, because you're not going to see any, uh, any money. Uh, and in some cases, it might be the right move. But here's the thing, guys. Treat people respectfully, you know? If somebody stood up for you in a place and they, they uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and then they get you at a certain point in your career, don't abandon them. Speak to them as a person and say, hey, let's come up with a solution here because obviously the label doesn't want you, but I'm going to give you some kind of sunset deal, which means I'm going to give you some percentage of my career over a period of time. So it helps you be honorable. Yeah, never be dishonorable. And, and Even, usually, a management deal will uh, will have a sunset provision, and uh, it uh, and if someone knows what they're doing, it'll be between three and five years. Uh, yeah, uh, something less than three years. I usually, if, if I'm representing the manager, I'll say. You're, you're unlikely to see uh, something on that. Yeah, even with record producers, it's the same thing. You get somebody who believes in you and they've stepped up, then all of a sudden the label signs you. They don't want that producer anymore. 
have have some kind of mechanism in that production contract where that producer gets maybe a 1% override for a period of time so he's treated fairly. Don't let them stomp all over that person. You know, stand up for yourself. Yeah. Usually you'll have a situation where a producer will uh, cut the master and, the, and they'll sell the record company on the artist with the master, but yeah. they'll re you know, we record the master or do something with that. And to, I mean, to, in a perfect them. world, that's good if they can do that. But yeah. a lot of times a label just re-record everything. Yeah, that's and say, we don't I'm want saying. your master. And we don't want your master, but and then that's he's what out. sold the label. But we don't want your master. We don't want your producer. So, yeah. you know, again, it's a, it's a business of relationships and uh, yeah. how you treat people on your way up uh, says a lot about who you're going to see uh, later on. Um, well, I karma mean, is a real thing. I mean, so. Your thought process, everything you think from the morning you get up, hey, I'm the luckiest guy you're ever going to meet in your life. Yeah. I've gotten everything in the world I want. If, yeah. if God took me out tomorrow, I've done it. Yeah. I'm happy. My kids are good. My life is, I wouldn't trade my life with anybody on this planet right now. I am happy. I'm happy. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. You know, but it's taking work, and it, it takes a mindset, and it takes. Try like, yeah, being an entertainment lawyer. In people Richmond, like Virginia. you guys, <laughs> hey, people like you guys in my life. Look at this, man! Come on, yeah. these are amazing guys here. It's one of the smartest guys here you're ever going to meet. H- this me guy tissue. here in his cross? own no, in his own right. You got it. The guy that owns a, a a working studio that knows how to do this right. And he's going to be fair with you. There's no BS in him. There's no game in him. And a lot of studios there are. I meet these Very clients so. and I, I go, I, what I, in I'll... the world are you paying them that much money for? He is incapable of that. Yeah. Yes, he's in business, but he's a fair man. Yeah, I, I'm going to I have to share one little story that it literally uh, came to a close uh, today. Uh, I was involved um, with a very... Uh, very, very wealthy couple that wanted to acquire a song that was written at, uh, by a university professor. And uh, they wanted to use the song for just charitable purposes. They didn't want to make any money off of it. They had all these ideas, this and that. Song has never been recorded, no revenue stream, anything like that. Mm-hmm. And the whole deal fell through because of one thing, greed. And, uh, and I'd already had instructions from the couple who said, okay, pay a premium, Give them something, but we want to control this because we're going to use it for charitable purposes and that. And, I mean, you talk about a, a song that was just maybe performed once or twice. Uh, they wanted um, six figures. They hired a music lawyer in Atlanta. Uh, it was just, it was just uh, a crazy, a, exactly right. And uh, I, I was invited uh, today um, earlier to meet with a couple because they were uh, passing through, and um, it was just sort of like, I'm sorry, I said to him, I'm a deal closer, but I could not, I could no way I could advise you to take this deal. And uh, what had been a beautiful situation now just turned toxic Mm. because, and had had the song writer just like taken something, which would have been a generous gift, uh, they would have recorded in Virginia, they would have made more money on, you know, recording fees, all the different things. Promoted, done all this stuff, but it was just. Uh, and you know who actually killed the deal? Who made it tough was the publisher, which is why I wanted to get into publishing mm-hmm. now, because uh, everybody wants publishing. The major labels, obviously. Right. Um, now I, I don't know. I'm going to ask you this: you, You've got publishing, don't you? Yeah. So uh, you administer publishing. I don't administer right now. Um, we. But you co-own. Yeah. Is it uh, co-pubs or co-publishing deals or just songwriter deals? It's, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about uh, how that works so for our audience. Okay. Well, uh, when you look at, at publishing, you're looking at a dollar bill. And a co-publishing deal for you would, would mean that you are making um, 20, uh, you are making 75 cents on the dollar instead of a, a full dollar. You're, you're, you're giving away 25 uh, cents of that dollar to a partner. Okay, and so that's what a that's what your co-pub would be. A full pub deal means that it's fifty cents for the publisher, fifty percent as you as the writer, which is what most deals are being done right now because it's too hard. Sure, you know when you took that album leader away from us when the album went away, it used to be that you could get a cut on an album and still make a lot of money. You would get a, a mechanical so. royalty uh, rate, which was considerable, but um, and. Uh, 
one of our niche, uh, Richmond natives, David Lowry, is, uh, I think, one of the major advocates of how artists are getting screwed in the digital world because you can have uh, zillions of hits on Spotify and have a small uh, check. So uh, technology, uh, that the technological platforms have not helped the artist uh, as they did when there were vinyl records, when there were uh, uh, CDs, and you could uh, track that because the, the labels, the publishing companies, uh, all got very wise in jumping on that. And well, so there's been an effort to try to regain uh, that ground. And a lot of that is mandated by uh, federal statute, that's right. copyright statute. Well, even our culture has changed, you know. We, we don't, you guys don't listen to albums. You're, in your, in your uh, song collection, you've got a little bit of blues, a little bit of this. That's not the way we listen. We would listen to a full album. So culturally, we have changed. So when that change happened with, with the album and people being able to get on uh, somebody's album and still make a lot of money, we went into a singles world. Yeah. Well. So unless you have the single you have no chance of making any big money because the albums are not selling anymore. Yeah, but from the artist's perspective... Unless you're Beyonce. It's one thing if you've printed a CD or pressed a vinyl, but here you have a digital that's in the cloud, and if it's on Spotify and it goes a million times, there's not much overhead on that. I'm just going to say, yet there's still not a payout, uh, which is, again, uh, David Lowry from uh, Camper Beethoven and Cracker and... Uh, has been a, a huge advocate uh, for. Um, what? Uh, so is the, is it still a lucrative revenue stream for artists on the publishing side? Yes. Non-major record label. It can be if you're an independent writer and you go get yourself what we call a, a, a writer's yeah. deal with Anthem or Warner Chapel or Sony Tree. You know they're going to give you what's called a draw, and that draw will be recoupable against the money that you bring in the door. Now, so you're you, writing for other you're writing for other artists at that. You're writing for other artists, right. yeah, mm -hmm. and that's your job every day. Now, in that sequence, if you're writing for Warner Chapel LA and you're a pop person or you're writing for country music artists, it is appropriate to move to those cities, maybe. Because you have more collaborators there that you can write with. Very important. It is inappropriate, in my opinion, some people disagree with me, to move to those cities uh, when you're an artist. And this is why it's not appropriate because there's too many of you there. You're not gonna build market share in Nashville by living there, okay? You can't really play anywhere. The places you can play, I prevent my clients. Don't you go down there, don't let me hear you playing down there. All that brings is mischief. It brings bad problems. How about showcasing? bad information, what? How about showcasing? Showcases, if it's a showcase, if, if, if you're coming to see them and there's a reason for the showcase or Scott Borchetta wants to see somebody, yes, it's an appropriate oh, Are showcase. they showing up for showcases or the no. labels? No, I didn't think so. No. Yeah. So they would I, rather I have, have clients who say I'm showcasing in Nashville and I'm thinking, okay, who's going to be their mom, dad? Yeah, they would rather have bamboo shoes driven under their fingernails than going down to Broadway. Yeah, and to, those to showcase. Talks. Nobody like me. So or, I just want to point that out to everyone. It's not necessarily. It's not the, the place to do. Thing. You know, those are called tourists. So the strategy, yeah, so, the the yeah. the strategy is to uh, build your market where you are. Yeah, or go where in, your do the is. business. If you have to record do there, it, L.A. It. If you have to network with the label, go in, take some time, network. Go in during, uh, if but, you're a country artist, you can go in and country radio seminar. Go to the NAM convention in Anaheim. I normally go out there every year. That's just, that's happening as we speak. There's all kinds of connections. Americana, if you're into. Yeah. Uh, you know. It's called music business, guys. Yeah. Network, business card, treat it like but a business. But the point I want to make to the audience, which is I think what I hear you say, but correct me if I'm wrong, is wherever you are, uh, build your audience. Build your niche. And, and you will, it will eventually. Yeah get discovered, whether it's on TikTok or uh, YouTube or uh, Bernard sees you at the Richmond International Film Festival. Where we were talking about Robin Thompson uh, earlier, because I didn't know it, but one of my cousins was probably Robin's biggest fan of all time, to the point, and he's a fascinating guy. He's, he's rebuilt a lot of these historical properties around here, you know, but you never know he had a dime if you met him. Hey, let me ask you, since in Robin's uh, memory here, isn't it in Bruce Springsteen's... You know, Robin used to play with uh, Bruce uh, Springsteen, and when Bruce would come to Virginia, Robin yeah. would always appear on stage. 
I have not read uh, Bruce's autobiography, but does he have like a line in that says uh, about Robin and said that Robin had too good of a voice and did not want to have... Oh, wow. uh, that's how great Robin Thompson was. Even Bruce Springsteen said he had too good of a voice and... Uh, uh, but I didn't realize he was such a fan of Robin because I had Robin's cell phone number. I used to book him down at Rogue's Gallery back when I was an agent in Virginia Beach yeah. eons ago. Yeah. And he was a nice guy. And he said that Robin used to have a home down off the, I don't know where that yeah, was. Like Middlesex but he, County, somewhere around there? Well, he had a, he had a beach home in Maxis. That's the one he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. And he said that he was working, building a house then. He was such a fan that he heard that Robin used to go up to the 7-Eleven to get his coffee. And he would hang out there hoping to see Robin. that he would come up and get yeah. his coffee. I said, wow, what a fan. Yeah. That's a fan. I said, what? if I'd have known, I could just make that happen. Uh, last thing, and then we'll move on from, from Robin. I'll just to tell you this, uh, Carlos, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, Robin, uh, Bruce let him have a, um, with doing a compilation album, had a, a track for for uh, for um, for Robin, and Robin wanted me to negotiate it. And I was going gangbusters. Uh, so Robin said, "Kirk, calm down. It's Bruce. I know Bruce." I went, "Okay." <laughs> so yeah. that's my Robin Thompson. You know, a lot of talent from Virginia. You know, one of the reasons I want to come back home. It's been a long time. Is uh, and we have offices in Austin. We have offices in L.A. And we're in Nashville. And we're in Columbia, Tennessee, which is where I hang out. But I've got a great team. It's not just about me. It's a big team of amazing people, the best in the world, what they do. My team has worked with everybody from Carrie Underwood, Beyonce, uh, and, and they are prolific. Grammy award-winning uh, producers, songwriters, you know, and we treat it like a medical practice. And you are the patient. And I am the doctor. And I'm looking at you for strengths and weaknesses. And I'm trying to build your career, not just musically, but mentally. You know, you're going to meet this young man in a minute. He's been with me since he's 12. Signed him to Disney when he was 15. Okay? Then all of a sudden, he decided he wanted to do something else. Kind of like I did, because I started out as a musician. And I worked with the Wooten Brothers. And I worked with uh, Keith Horn and... Uh, Dane Bryant, if you know some of these names, these are some of the greatest. And when we came from the Virginia area, and we didn't know any better. So when we go down and audition in Nashville and different places for gigs, we blow the competition away because we were kind of dumb. We learned every style. We could play jazz, rock, country, chicken picking. We did everything, and people from other parts of the world would come in, and they'd have one specific style as a player. So the versatility of the musicians in Virginia always won over. Yeah. Amazing musicians from Virginia. So I know there's a hotbed of talent here. I know that there is, and we're looking forward to digging in a little bit here. All right, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, some aspects. Uh, managers these days, yeah. 20% still? Well, it depends. I mean, so I just talk about managers. I just signed an artist, and uh, it's not public, but he does ten million a year. I'll take three percent of that. Okay. You say I'm not going to get twenty percent of that. He made that ten million, not me. <laughs> right? That's not fair. Why would you? Would you go in and if you have making ten million a year, somebody I'm going to get twenty percent from doing for your new manager? No, you can. Then you're but a brand new artist. That just starting out, 20%. twenty percent. Twenty percent. If you're making money, it's all logical, guys. This is not rocket science. Most of you have a pretty good gut instinct. No matter what it is, okay. Trust the gut, because it will be right more than this wrong. And uh, when we were talking about the the old management deal that we were fighting against, what I was fighting over was I wanted uh, at that time um, Bernard's Boris yep. to give milestones. To say, okay, um, you know, instead of just a straight management deal that said five years, seven years, you know, for what, where the manager loses interest in you, you're just stuck. I said, okay, what's the goal in two years? Is it a major record deal? Whatever that would be defined as in a contractual, would it be a dollar amount? And if you hit that milestone, then you continue on as a manager. Oh, and or you know future milestones and and that's a um, that's still a sensitive subject at time for some managers but it also tells me a lot of the confidence level of the of the manager now I don't know in in your situation when you're managing you're doing a lot I don't know there in my view there are certain types of managers some that just say hey um, I'm gonna 
try to manage you and just see what I can do. And then there are others that invest a lot in artist development, uh, you know, whether they're throwing, you know, budgets at the artist or other sorts of things. Right. Tell me about artist development side of management or how that, how that works. If, I, if you discover me and, and you just say, Kirk's the bomb, yeah. I got to have Kirk. And you say, I want to, but, you know, Kirk, um, that beard, got to yeah. do something about the beard. That tone, <laughs> yeah, ponytail. The beard, you know, all the, all the whatever it is, your uh, voice cracks every now and then. Wh what are you going to do? What, what kind of development services are we talking about? And what would I be expecting? Yeah. Well, you have to treat it just like I, my beautiful wife, Molly, is here. I'm the luckiest guy in the world, most beautiful woman in the world, inside and out. It's very similar to a marriage. And you've got to, uh, you have to treat it that from a business. You better know that person. You better be like being around that person. That You have to grow to the point with that person that they know how to even make decisions on your behalf. Because if you are successful together, it's going to get to the point where you're going to be moving so fast that you're going to turn over some type of power of attorney to that manager that he can sign off on things. An example would be, if you're in Charlotte and the next thing you know, you get an office in Greenboro, Greensboro, North Carolina, the distance is right, the date's open, he knows you'll take another $35,000 for that day, he's going to book it, you say, without even talking to you, because it's moving fast. He doesn't have time to lose. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, okay? You better feel in your heart that it's a trustworthy thing, and um, it's very difficult for an uh, independent artist to get uh, a manager of any um, uh, clout mm -hmm. at that because it, and this is why because you're not making any money if you were if you were making a hundred thousand dollars a year you know and if he had a 20 percent deal that's just twenty thousand dollars that's not a lot of money when he can go over here and book uh, you know a band for four hundred thousand and he's got a 10 or 15 or 20 percent deal on that yeah so you see where he's going to spend his time that in that in lies the problem Okay, I'm not opposed or, uh, you know, because I have clients that have managers and sometimes they're young managers and I'm not opposed to them starting with somebody that's green as long as I see ambition, passion in them and they're willing to work. But it usually doesn't end well for them. I mean, I'm just going to be, it usually doesn't end well. No, it those. doesn't. I'm just no. being up, up front. But here. So prepare, here it is, prepare the agreement with someone like this gentleman so their exit strategy. So if it doesn't end well, then we know what the trigger is going to be. You're going to get a sunset. And sunset is a smaller percentage over a period of time that you're treating that person, even at that point, even though it's uh, discombobulated at that point, you're treating them with respect. I can't emphasize that with you guys. Respect in people. Treat and, and, people respectfully. And sometimes it ends well. I'm not going to say that it it never ends well, but sometimes it does. It, it is, a, it is whether you know two people have a synergy. I mean, I can think of uh, some major names that who managers have been with them forever, uh, just because through thick and through thick and thin. Um, but also remember where you come from, because the opposite of that is you're extremely successful, and then all of a sudden you stagger for a minute. Oh, no, it couldn't be your fault. You're the artist. You're perfect. It's that manager. We're going to change managers. That's going to change the course. Sometimes maybe that is the, the cause. Sometimes it isn't. Have people around you that are going to be honest with you. Here's the problem, and I've seen it all my life. People that, you know, I've been around the billionaires. I've seen all the par. I've seen everything you can see, the good, the bad, the ugly, met the devil, all of that. Done it. Okay. Seen the good tie too, but just remember that in in your course that that, that integrity, treating people with respect. You're going to keep hearing that from me, you know, and planning for the what ifs contractually. Yeah. Well, uh, I think one of the hardest jobs I have is telling it like it is to a client and saying, "This doesn't look good. This is not a good situation." But you have to. You need to get your. Yeah. Uh, can we say shit together? Well, anyway, I've already said it. You need to. Get your act together. And, um, and sometimes clients don't want to hear that. They're, they're off in their own little world or they get sidetracked or whatever. Again, it, if you don't have a laser focus 
on what you're doing and where you're going and how you're treating people. It's a very tough and unfriendly uh, business yeah. to be in. Um, okay. So, uh, and this will sort of lead into, I've been watching the, the clock here. Where do you see, uh, we, we've just touched on uh, record deals, management, touring, there's some money in touring, the importance of uh, being in the digital world today, some uh, songwriting, uh, publishing, so if anyone has questions about those uh, in the Q&A, feel free to, uh, to jump in on those things. I, I will make one little quick note before I ask you this question. If anyone's seen the Whitney Houston documentary, has anyone seen it here? OMG, okay, because that is uh, an incredible um, story of how uh, not only the rise, but the fall. Yeah. And they, the, the filmmakers in that, did an excellent job at finding all the people who, who, who were there when she was falling down and what the reasons were and what was happening. And uh, it, it, it's just a very humbling, sad story, because I remember having third row seats in the Richmond Coliseum when Whitney Houston, you know, came to town, but, and to see um, the clips of what, what happened. So it's a, it's a tremendous story of how you can really get to the top, and it could all fall very fast. I was around MC Hammer, and I wasn't the person you see here today, okay? I was an up-and-coming executive. But um, I saw him go through $30 million in a year with nothing to show for it. How do you even do that? How do you go through $30 million with no assets, nothing? And there was nobody around him to call it out. I remember being in Minnetonka, Minnesota, where we rented the entire Marriott Hotel oh for, for, for a week. We had a fleet of limousines out front on the clock, just sitting there, not doing a thing. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody strong enough in that group to come up to him and say, what are you doing? Do you realize what you're doing? Everybody's riding your coattails and money was flowing. That, that hotel could have changed its marquee to hell and it would have been appropriate. Okay, you gotta have people around you that will call you out on your stuff. They are golden. Those people, don't ever look bad at them from them being honest with you about where you are in life. Those people are the ones you want around you, not the people that are riding your coattails and there for the fun and tell you everything that you ever wanna hear. Always remember that. Yeah. That's what destroyed Whitney. She didn't have that either. You get so big and powerful, people are afraid. Oh, that's the queen. How dare us? But that's exactly what they need. Yeah. yeah no, I, I um, am involved with a, a major, major, major athlete. And um, same stuff. Same stuff. Uh, yeah. The manager. I'm not a fan of the manager because I feel like he takes advantage of the, even the accountant. I'm not, they, and they don't like me. And I don't particularly care uh, for them. And he, um, he goes places and all of a sudden uh, 20 people are invited and I'm like, what the, what is this? What's going on here? You know? Well, one of the biggest honors of, of my career is I, I managed a lot of the iconic rock guys. I managed Little Richard. I managed Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis. Lewis right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember uh, at the 930 club, you yeah, had yeah, me up that's there. Right. Yeah. yeah. DC. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, you that's right. There. Mm -hmm. And that, that, um, I, I kind of fell into it actually. And uh, I booked a little Richard on a corporate affair at the Montaventure Hotel in Las Vegas off a of cold call. And my mother was such a fan of little Richard, and God bless her soul, I'm going to see her grave tomorrow, um, that that meant something to me. And I made sure that his, his rider, which he asked for everything, and t somebody at that level, you go through that rider, no, I'm not going to give you that. Not, they're not going to argue as long as you're paying them the money. But I had everything, including the piano in his suite, I lined that up. So in his hotel suite, got him the presidential suite, piano in the room, all the teas and honeys yeah. and everything laid out exactly like he the wanted. The green M&M's. And at the end of that show, green M&M's. It's, it's important. At the end of that show, and I wasn't even planning on bugging him, you know, I I, he did a great show for me. We killed it at the booksellers convention. And all of a sudden, the row manager said, Little Richard wants to meet the man that respected him that here today. Took me up to the suite, 
And within 30 minutes, we were singing at the piano. If you don't know me by now. Yeah. I mean, we're, I'm singing harmony with the king of rock and roll. Yeah. And I had a 12-year relationship with him that made me millions of dollars because I'm doing it right yeah. and treating people with respect. And that woman that called me and said, Mr. Porter, my name is Sandra Riggs, and I've been handed something and I don't know what to do. Somebody told me you could help me. I said, what is it, ma'am? She said, I have to produce an event for the Booksellers Convention in Los Angeles, California. And I said, what kind of budget do you have? She said, I have about a half million dollars. I said, well, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it all began. Yeah. I made money. I developed a relationship with the king of rock and roll. And from Little Richard, Richard told Jerry Lee Lewis about me. And Jerry Lee Lewis called me at the house, and he said, this is Jerry Lee Lewis. I like to speak to Bernard Porter. And I hung up on him because I thought it was my buddy, Kevin, playing a joke on me. And then he calls back, and then I realized it was him. Yeah. He said, I want to fly you down to Nesmith, Mississippi. I want to talk to you. I said, yes, sir, I'll be there. Yeah. Flew into Memphis. He sent a car, went in. I'll never forget as long as I live. I sat on the couch. He comes in. He had a white robe with a pipe. And he sat there. He said, son? I want you to take over. Little Richard said, I can trust you. In my mind, I'm going, this is going to be crazy. This is going to be crazy. <laughs> but how can you turn it down? Yeah. So I fl I've flown all over the world with, with Little Richard and, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. And the greatest stories um, that you can ever imagine, the magic of these guys. I mean, these guys were living dinosaurs. And Jerry Lee Lewis is still living. He just got inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame as a country artist. He was the very first artist to be put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah. Okay? And, uh, All right. Um, so let's talk about what you see the trends are in the music business now. Yeah. What, what, are the, what are the current trends that you think people need to be aware of, uh, either as an artist trying to make it, or where is the money these days? What is the... Okay. And that may be a good lead into... Yeah. Well, beware, beware, beware. There's a lot of fictitious things out there to hook you. There's a lot of streaming. If you see the words for 100,000 streams for $150, you know, it, 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 we're going Terminator, guys, is what we're doing here. It's here. We're going Terminator. Technology, technology, technology. Technology, you have to embrace it. You have to be a perennial. You have to study. I wish you guys didn't have that on you. I didn't have that on me when I was a musician, but you do. Okay, you either have to be an expert or you got to have somebody that knows what they're doing. It's all about authentic, real, bona fide growth. Don't buy into the bots. Don't buy into any of this crap that's out there. And uh, because what happens is people like me, we have software that we can tell very quickly what's happening. If we get on your YouTube channel and we see that your streams or your views are bought, even, even there's programs that even you can get likes, you can get comments. It's all out there right now. It may, it may serve you in the sense that your fans may think you got something going on. But people, if you're going after a deal where somebody's going to put money and investment into you, it's going to be counterintuitive because they're going to run from you. Because uh, when we take on clients, sometimes it's a lot of that that comes in, and we have to start the relationship not by progressing them, but spending money on cleaning them up because they've made bad decisions in the world of signing on to this, signing on to that. You better be sure about it and make sure everything is real. Because if, if, if a label or a manager, they see that things are not real in one platform, they're going to assume that you're doing that across all platforms. And they see it's a big mess mm. that maybe they don't want to be a part of. Yeah. Maybe they try to help you clean it up, but maybe they don't. So... Uh, um, Will is going to be on a minute. We can yeah, talk in and, more uh, depth we'll talk, if you uh, want. Just a few minutes, and then uh, let Will speak for a few minutes, and then we'll uh, take uh, Q&A uh, from uh, our audience. Yeah, we can get in deeper with him. He can get into the technological thing. And, and really, Will's coming in to just give you tips on the, the trend of marketing yourself, the, the digital yeah. aspect, which we thought was would be very important uh, for, for everybody. Um, uh, and then, uh, I mean, this is the, the lawyer thing, but I can't tell you how many uh, copyright infringement cases I've been yeah. involved in and some of the craziest stories. Uh, you know, to have a, a copyright infringement 
um, you really need two things. One, you have to prove access to the music. And then second, it has to be substantially similar. So the, the more on point you are to the music, the access, I mean, it can't be like in the, the mail room, mm -hmm. you know, over at uh, Arista or something like that, where, where there are cases like, out there like that then the need for it to be substantially similar is not as great as opposed to more uh, remote. Uh, I'm always amazed Michael Bolton got nailed for Love is a Beautiful Thing with the uh, Isley Brothers for having heard it. They were able to prove he heard it on a radio while driving in L.A. Um, w one case I had against a, a major artist was um, he, uh, he came to uh, town, checked out his high school buddy, needed a certain genre of music that his high school buddy said to his buddy, hey, um, I'm going to make you good. I'm going to produce <laughs> something for you. And uh, high school buddy took it and gave him a song, downloaded it, hold on yards, and next thing you know, disappeared. And uh, next thing you know, high school buddy, my client, sees him performing on The Tonight Show. Oh, <laughs> That's my all gosh, wow. Part. Yeah. So, um, and uh, you... You know, there are all these layers you go through when you're going after somebody, and they tell you, uh, well, we've determined it's not. And I go, well, that's very nice, because I've determined that it is a problem uh, for you. But ultimately, um, what nailed the case was, I said, look, um, I can give you your client's cell phone number. Would you like your clients? Because I have all the text messages between, uh, and that, that started the, mm. the settlement the negotiations. So but I'm just saying that uh, in, in my world, I can't tell you how many calls I get a week and um, someone has taken someone's music or someone has had access to it. And I'll say the majority of the time, there's nothing there in, in the sense from a legal standpoint. There may be something there from a personal, you know, whatever standpoint, but to prove a, an infringement case is very difficult. And... Um, in this instance, I'll have to tell you, that you still have to have damages. And in this instance, this song almost was going to get nominated for a Grammy. But it, we were waiting. It, it, I would give away too much if I told you, but so much of it. But it ended up getting um, an NAACP Spirit Award. Hmm. And uh, which, you know, so the lawyers in L.A. were telling me, well, there's no money here. And I said, that's fine. We just want to contact the NAACP and have them give the award to my client. You know, we would take that in an RP, that sure. like, you know. And, uh, and so, um, uh, and they did not like this guy from Richmond, Virginia, just, you know, kicking him around a little bit. So I went out there to negotiate and um, went down the lobby. This is just to buy time until uh, I got another minute here. Went down the lobby, and I saw another buddy of mine who was an entertainment lawyer in L.A. He was in the lobby. And it turned out he was with the uh, major partner of the firm mm. representing this guy. I said, hey, so I said, how you doing? I said, yeah, I was just up here. That, And the guy went, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a scene. You only get those maybe once or twice in the, the yeah. music lawyer world. Well, All right, we just about ready. I was just uh, filling. We got one minute. Okay, well, you we know, I fortunately in. haven't had a lot of uh, incidents with that because yeah. we try to... I, I you see, see it. it because you're an attorney. I see it, yeah, of course. Uh, and I, it's, uh, if you are, I'm just going to say, you sampling, you're... Heard someone's music. Somehow you have access to it. It's it's not a good thing. Right. If you're, and unfortunately, if you're the one infringe, if you're not documenting and keeping track of things, uh, I mean Ashley. I don't know if uh, Ashley's still here or not. But we, we've had you and I can think of some instances where we know it was stolen. We just can't get there, and it, it just hurts. Mm -hmm. You know it's been stolen, but it just can't get there thinking of one I hear it a lot on uh, contemporary Christian radio that I hear a track and the newsboys are a client of mine and they're one of the biggest bands in, in contemporary Christian music touring and uh, uh, Wes Campbell is one of my Gosh, best friends I almost did a deal with the newsboys I didn't uh, it's a remarkable business model they're I mean, a lawyer uh, in uh, yeah I was representing um, a major charity that was uh, going uh, interesting I have to tell you some news voice story I'll have. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead, keep going. I yeah. interrupted you. Over 20, 25 years and still kicking, still yeah. selling, you know, s small uh, Faith arenas. Faith-based. Yeah. 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 But it's, uh, and West, their manager, he's just, uh, 
he's he's something else. I mean, he is such a he's always ahead of the curve. He's always thinking yeah, forward. Yeah, he's, he's got to make. I mean, he was doing legal the 360 structures. thing ten years ago. I mean, yeah. we talk about it now, but he was already on that. But uh, and he has a, a terrific management company. Um, but uh, I didn't know that. I have to catch up with you about that. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we're at the seven o'clock, uh, seven oh one. So we uh, ready to bring in? Uh, bring Will. Will in, yeah. And Will, uh, Will Muse uh, is the president of our digital company, and Will has been with me a long, long time. Even though he's he'll be turning twenty soon, but he is remarkable academically. Uh, he is one of he's he's uh, this is a multi million dollar company at this point. Our digital media company. We represent pharmaceutical companies and um, law law firms. Medical practices, artists, um, and it's just it's 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 been he's been a, a just a great blessing in my life, and he's at Porterhouse, which is our state in Columbia, which is built in 1833, and uh, welcome, Will. Can you hear us? Will, can you hear us? Hello. Do you guys hear me? Yeah, we can, buddy. We were talking Fantastic. about. Uh, I'm let you, yeah, oh, okay, uh, Will. I'm Kirk Schroeder. Nice to meet you. Fantastic. Great to meet you as well. And uh, Bernard has uh, hyped you up uh, today to talk about um, the digital marketing aspect. Yes. Because uh, one thing that we were trying to emphasize to any of the, the artists out here or those in the business is um, how – ah, thank you so much. Uh, much better. Yeah, much better than uh, – is how to um, – that how important technology is in just getting uh, – your name, your brand out, and, uh, you know, even how to monetize technology. So we were going to just ask if, if you could speak a little bit about that, and then we're going to open the floor in the bigger picture for a Q&A. So just maybe about uh, 10 minutes or so, if you don't mind, just talking about that, and then we'll get to the Q&A for about uh, 20 minutes or so. Yes, well, absolutely. You know, within, you know, the music industry, you know, it is all about going through and, you know, establishing a real and authentic fan base, you know, having a core, you know, group of people who are there to really consume and enjoy to share, you know, your product that you have, you know, put into place. And some of the strategies in which, you know, we will utilize to build and to grow that fan base is through, you know, some very targeted marketing throughout all of the major digital platforms such as your YouTube, your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, your Spotify, and your streaming story. And it is all about really going through and developing proof of concept. You know, you could be one of the most talented artists within the entire world. You could have the greatest visuals, the greatest voice, you know, the greatest aesthetics that are out there. And essentially, you know, whenever you have the attention of the industry, you have to show that you have a fan base established and that you have people who are there in demand of your product so that they can you know, justify the risk and invest in your career, let's say in potentially a label scenario. And essentially within PCG Digital, what we have been able to do is take the major record label strategies. You know, we spent tens of thousands of hours learning and understanding how they competitively market their artists. We took the same strategies and made them both scalable and affordable. You know, for all of our clients within PCG, as well as you know, the public, we have the exact same software systems and able to really you know, scale the advertisements that we run, as well as we have you know, over 500 of the top independent playlists within all of Spotify, you know, utilizing all of these tools in order to you know, create tailored release plans have really given our artists the edge. We have been able to achieve, it has been over 2 billion million cumulative streams, over 500 million digital views for all of our clients, as well as around 8 to 10 billion total impressions throughout what we do you know, within PCG Digital. Ah, great. So um, what, are the, uh, what are the basics uh, then that uh, people need to know about getting into uh, the, the digital marketing? Uh, what are just some of the fundamental tips you would give to our audience? Well, it really all starts with, you know, kind of finding your niche and having very compelling content because, you know, we are in a world where there are between 50 to 70,000 songs that are released every single day. And there are billions of posts that are put out every day throughout platforms such as Instagram, 
on TikTok. So whenever you have you know wonderful product, compelling content, you know that really assists kind of the digital marketing process and makes it you know much easier for what we do, and we have you know, a much greater likelihood of success when we have that quality you know product and image and kind of you know the, the what else that you know, comes to an artist's career. And how are you seeing? Uh the monetization world is it uh, are you seeing monetization off of youtube spotify talk a little bit about yes how- absolutely so there is always you know a good portion of revenue that can be derived from streaming as well as you know from youtube instagram reels is now paying there's monetization opportunities within tiktok but you know what we really like to view you know, the entire digital marketing process we like to view that as means of advertisement for the deeper meets of one's career such as you know the live shows the endorsements the media placements opportunity merchandise sales you know, it all is, you know, a great you know, part of the larger package for an artist. So um, if an artist is coming to you for the first time, what's a typical plan for that artist? So essentially, you know, what we will do is we will go through all of their digital platforms and we will kind of run a full audit and an analysis. So we will see, you know, what they are doing correctly. You know, if there's any fictitious streams or followers or anything, you know, any bad practices that have been previously implemented before they are coming to us, as well as, you know, we will see what content you know, really goes through and is resonating with their audience and their consumer you know, at, at a high level. What we will then do is begin you know, setting up different ad campaigns, trying different pieces of content in what I like to call the prospecting phase. And we will test you know, different campaigns, different audiences, different content styles in order to really go through and define an artist's you know, target consumer. And we take a very data-driven approach in that sense. Got it. And so when you're looking at the analytics for an artist and you're explaining, what will those analytics say? This is how many viewers you have. This is yes, how many the viewers, what's the an followers, the engagement rate, you know, the followers to engagement. We see all types of, you know, artists, they might come to us, they might have 150,000 followers, yet they're getting 15 or 20 likes on their posts. That shows that there is, you know, a major problem that we need to correct there. With, with That would be like a major problem with content, right? Well, it would also be, you know, potentially some false followers, vanity followers, ah, fake okay. practices that have been put into place before us. Mm-hmm. I see. Yes. Um, so uh, just in our few minutes, we we'll take a Q&A. What's your best advice for artists that, or others that are just trying to get in the digital space? What, what would you say in just a minute or two just to our audience here? And we may get some questions well, on this topic as well. Well, you know, as you know, I did state, you know, compelling content is always, you know, one of the core fundamentals of, you know, succeeding within the digital world. It's always, you know, finding your niche, you know, what is unique about you as an artist? And, you know, it's also, you know, for independent artists out there, people coming into the industry, it's that, you know, we need to be at the realization where, you know, we are competing with such a massive and immense saturation of content that is within the marketplace. As I stated, you know, we have between 50 and 70,000 songs that are released every single day, you know, within Spotify throughout all of the DSPs. You know, that statistic is actually, you know, um, it's estimated to be anywhere from 150,000 to 200,000 songs released every single day by the year of 2000. And you know what that you know kind of you know makes me want to you know preach to independent artists is that you um, the days of you know just putting something out and it going viral and receiving you know major amounts of tr- you know, traction, it is an anomaly. You know, you can't just put something out without having strategy behind it. And it's really, you know, what we can implement on the digital side that connect, you know, those last few dots in order to reach, you know, visibility, to reach, you know, an audience, to begin, you know, building brand awareness and a fan base. And that visibility that we bring into place through our digital marketing strategies, that will, you know, lead to greater opportunity within the industry. Great. Well, that's an excellent point, uh, those that are hoping that just something goes uh, viral. Uh, well, I hope you're taking good care of the porterhouse. 
Yes. Down you there. Got a beautiful place. You've got to, you've got to uh, come I'm visit. Not sure what I see in the mirror there in the background, but I'm not going to point that out uh, to anybody. That's here. one of Molly's uh, chandelier uh, collection. Well, no, I just saw a, a couple beer kegs or some things uh, back there. But right. I might, <laughs> I might, my eyesight might be a little. Uh, well, <laughs> no, okay. All right. Well, uh, so um, first off, Bernard, thank you. No, my pleasure. Uh, very much. Let's give Bernard a big uh, round of applause. Thank you, Will. I don't know if we're going to get uh, many questions off of Zoom or not, but if there are uh, those I, that if, are... if I may, there's a lot of we have a lot of celebrities online. Andy Kirk is out here, a big YouTuber, big producer. He's online. Uh, one of my pastors is online. Want to say hello to him? He's been sending me screenshots. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of cool people out there watching. Awesome. So glad All to right, have well, them. Well, uh, this is our time for uh, Q and A, and so if you are watching online and you want to um, ask a question, uh, I guess you put it in the chat box. And, uh, and then anyone in the audience who has a question, I'll just go first, just come on up to the mic and uh, ask your question, and we'll, if you identify yourself and go from there. Yeah, and Andy, uh, thank you for being here. I thought we might be able to pipe you in, but we do not have the access to do that. Appreciate you being here today. Okay. Well, well go ahead with your question. How about that? Before we... Ashley Brooks, I'm your law partner. Okay, good to know. I know her. I have a cover with the audience is when we get an artist calling us and we ask them questions about are they registered with a PRO, do they know what royalties are, how to collect royalties, all the different kinds of royalties because it is sort of a quagmire of definitions. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you coach an artist to educate themselves on that? Because it's great if an artist can call us and say, I'm registered with ASCAP, I've you know, I've got the publisher's share, I'm not the writer, or whatever the scenario is. How would you coach an artist to educate themselves on that? Okay, well... Uh, we, music publishing. Yeah, well, first of all, your PRO, which stands for Performing Rights Organization, you have BMI, you have ASCAP, you have SOCAN in Canada, which CSAC. is... CSAC. Yeah, and CSAC. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, so um, the first thing is figure out who you want to be with. Now, from my perspective, in studying all of those, I like BMI. Because I, I figured out very quickly through a song that I had, and there was a co-writer on the song, and I wasn't the writer, it was one of my songwriters. But when I got my check, and me and, I was with ASCAP at that time, he, his writer was with BMI, and we compared notes. Where he his check was substantially well, more than they mine. They have different formulas, some they emphasize different things. Yeah. So I found out very quickly that BMI was more technologically advanced because they made more money for the same song, the same split. So from that point on, I started recommending BMI just for the obvious reason that BMI was investing more in technology, in technology and collection. So, uh, but you make your own decision. Sound Research, exchange. Yeah, sound exchange is very, very important. important. Most artists are not set up well, on all platforms. Just because you have your PRO set up correctly does not mean that you have all your collection uh, entities set up right. Yeah. So you got to get your sound exchange Which right. Which is for the digital world. Correct. Uh, the uh, uh, PROs are for um, music over the radio, yep. to the extent there is such a thing. Uh, the old boombox rule, um, music uh, mechanical uh, uh, licenses, I'm sorry, uh, sound recordings uh, playing on record sales yeah. and any type of public performance in a football stadium. There are lots of uh, legal cases about uh, people, a uh, car deal is getting sued for playing the radio in the uh, car lot and, um, and the BMI or ASCAP rep hit some for, or in public venue, if you're a uh, very important point, if you're in a public uh, venue and you're playing in a place and they don't have an ASCAP BMI license and uh, the, that rep shows up, you're going to be just as liable as the venue is. So it's a very important negotiating point when you all venues these days have them, but it's not a sure thing yeah. depending on the size of the venue, but you want to make sure that someone has that license. Uh, and also because those venues, talking about what he's talking about, they're paying that licensing fee. You know, if you have a bar or a club, that money is a, a pool for you. If you're an artist that's out there touring and playing clubs and nightclubs, mm-hmm. you can approach your PRO and get Excellent your point. portion of that. Excellent point. That's income that's sitting there that your income, yeah. if you don't claim it, they're not going to yeah, let you know. A lot of uh, artists fail so, to report to their PRO where yeah. they're performing or what they're doing in order to get a slice of that pie yeah. when they do their calculations. Yes. 
Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Ashley, and you know, first, thank you guys. We so have much. two Ashleys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay. <laughs> I'm Ashley B as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm an artist, also known as Mary Jane, and I wanted to know. How does an artist position themselves in front of people who are legit? Bernard, like you said, it was it's a jungle out here. So to come across so many sly people and snakes, how do we avoid that? Okay, what I would say to that is, is if you were going to build a mansion and you found a builder, mm -hmm. wouldn't you want to see like some of that builder's work, ask the question? Right. But I find so, smart people, when they meet somebody, they're afraid to ask for references. When somebody asks me for references, I'm, I think it's, they're smart people. Like, who have you worked with? Who can I talk to you about you? I don't know you. I mean, I think you're a nice person, this person that you're meeting. Uh, but w what, what kind of background you can give me, somebody that I can check you out? Because we're in a jungle, as you know. And if they have any backup on that, mm -hmm. Or, or they wink uh, or blink because of that question, then you know that maybe there's something there that's not quite right. And you even, have to vet that and, person. And even it doesn't, I mean, uh, but you make an excellent point, uh, Bernard. Due diligence is absolutely, absolutely critical in this business. And, um, and I can't tell you how many times an artist will say, oh, I don't want to offend anybody, you know. <laughs> Uh, oh, and, you know, sometimes we as lawyers have to do the due diligence and ask the difficult questions. Uh, I can say I can have been on calls where uh, the clients asked me to do the due diligence questions. And, um, and then after we finish, the client will get a call from the other side saying, yeah. your lawyer doesn't know what he's talking about, which is always a red flag. Right. Or uh, I don't think this is the right fit. So she's you one or the other, or you know, this is this is what what we got. So due diligence, yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you all again. Um, I'm a pop and R&B song. What's your name? Uh, my name's Andy. Hey, Andy. Um, so specific question for you, Mr. Porter. Um, so the songwriter, not an artist. Um, negotiating points in terms of writers' credits uh, for artists when they don't actually contribute to the writing process. I know it's a practice that happens. Uh, how many points is it actually like reasonable to give? But let, then, let's clarify: they have not contributed to the process. Correct. So in one where the artist does not contribute, but then still, then why are you giving them anything? It's just a practice that I've seen and really? I've heard about. Well, there, it's, there, it's, a wrong, a it's a wrong practice. It's a wrong I, practice, I, very I, much I so. Agree. Yeah. And so then, as someone who is not represented uh, or has a deal with a publishing company, what kind of leverage? Do I well, have? You have uh, let me jump in on this, uh, if you don't mind. Um, uh, there are always folks out there that play gotcha in the songwriting process. They add a word or they do something and they act like you know they should own the song or be part of it. And um, you know, there sometimes you just have to stand your ground to that. Uh, otherwise, you're just getting hijacked. Yeah. Um, uh, one major, major band that I'm quite familiar with, uh, they have it in their agreement that they will go by consensus. And so they have to agree. Any song that they work on together in their agreement, they have to agree on the percentages of in, of, in the song. And that's what keeps it. So that's the ideal world. Mm -hmm. But when you say that uh, they didn't contribute anything, I say zero, and that's a bad practice yeah, right. I mean, to even let somebody have that, put up with that. And I don't know what kind of leverage they have with you to, to be able to make you give them something. Am I missing something here? No, no, no. You, uh, I think that you just have to um, be very upfront with them and say, uh, you know, this is not the way it's done, and maybe they're going to learn something from this. Um, I mean, it, it seems like a very strange situation. It's I, probably not as common at the level that I am currently, but there was a few articles in 2021 that were kind of an expose about it being a, com a more common practice at the major. Well, level. usually there's leverage That's involved. That's the point, yeah. And it's you brutal know. in Atlanta. Atlanta's a lot. Atlanta's yeah. a brutal music industry town in the fact that taking advantage of people and people coming in and they have 30 people on one song because they're going to get a part of it. They didn't do anything because that's just the way the politics are played because you're not going to get your song. I don't agree yeah. with any of that crap. Yeah, that, wrong, and it happens. Wrong, wrong. But that's usually because there's someone who's a heavy hitter that comes in that you yeah. need and does that. And so there's no rule of thumb to that. That's just 
hoping you don't get bled. Cool. Roll the dice, cool. Uh, yeah. But as a general practice, the, the answer is zero. They shouldn't get anything. Cool. I appreciate the answer. Yeah. yeah, good luck. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, and let us know if there are any Zoom questions. I don't know. Okay. All right. Come on. Thank you, Reese. Hey, how are you guys doing? Hey. Good, man. Uh, my name is Eric. Um, I just, uh, well, thank you once again for the stories and for the uh, all of the information. I really do appreciate it. Um, I couldn't help but notice there was a, sort of one aspect to the industry um, that I had a question about. But um, I'll preface it with, so I used to be a union art director skilled member. Uh, I worked a lot on product placement and uh, endorsements and things like that. What union? Uh, ADG, Local 800, okay. uh -huh. out in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Spent a lot of time out there. But um, I was just wondering what you're your opinions were on um, revenue streams for uh, endorsements and product placements. Like you'll see a lot of people these days in the, uh, the visual medium, music videos uh, specifically, they'll have an alcohol sponsor or they'll have a brand of tennis shoes okay. and they're getting money, um, obviously, per, uh, per video that they're doing. So um, is that still a viable source of income? Or Absolutely is that, it is, yeah, but you, you have so. to look at it one way. They have to, you have to have an audience that that sponsor is interested in getting in front of. In the same way that a label is paying for an opening position for an artist that's unknown, they're trying to put that audience in front of an audience that they feel will like that artist, therefore they'll sell records. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. If you've got a group of people that, let's say Harley Davidson, let's say you build an audience and you want Harley to be your tour sponsor. If they feel that you're hitting their core demographic, they may force them to drive over and buy the new motorcycle of the year, then they're gonna be interested in you. You know, well, it's like, what is the lifestyle of your consumer? Then that tells you what sponsors to go after. And, you know and yeah, and, and there are really two elements of this. Um, long ago, I used to represent the Maytag repairman, believe it or not. And, uh, and there have been some uh, versions of uh, the Maytag repairman. That type of person was more uh, focused on public appearances and maybe not uh, runs of commercials. You know, and, and bias. If and the other aspect of if you have something that's in a spot, you know, uh, then you're either making money by the renewal of that spot every how many weeks it is, or getting a percentage based on um, its uh, play. And in that type of deal, you're asking for uh, records, broadcast records, like if it's a Super Bowl spot, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So. The, it's it's out there. It just depends on what type of what you bring to the table in that regard. Whether it's just in the content, or there's a personality involved, or as Bernard says, you're sponsoring and you're getting a brand, uh, the exposure in a way that they. It, want. It's not just in the music business. Michael Jordan made more money in sponsorships than he did in basketball. Of course, yeah. I mean, there's no even comparison to it. You know, so you want to get to the point where you have those sponsors because that can be some real money for you, not only from the touring aspect but from the placement aspect. Mm -hmm. Bob Seger, remember the song "Like a Rock." Three million dollars for those three words. A million dollars a word for one commercial. Yeah. Like a rock. And Chevy milked that for all its work. But they, they branded their, their, their trucks. Yeah. You know? And it was, it was a perfect marriage of those three words. Yeah. Well, and as you're talking about that, if I can just interject one more thing. Um, would you say that we're seeing this sort of... Um, this blurred lines between video medium and the, the audio world? Like, now, if you don't release a song with a music video you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. So we're almost seeing this commercial aspect, advertising, audio and video coming hand in hand. Well, it, it, uh, uh, more, and this is a good plug for you. I was sitting in an executive meeting with the Disney executive in Los Angeles, in Burbank. And um, I was there actually for a showcase, but uh, actually Will was with me too. And uh, they were talking about how the lyric video was getting them more traction than the full length music video. And it costs a fraction of the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, because people like singing along, they like learning the words. So that's that's a, uh, you can make that you can go to Fiverr and, and figure out how to do that, guys. Take your camera phone, shoot yourself, get somebody to shoot you looking cool walking down the street or whatever. Do the editing model, get the words off of Fiverr or put the words, get somebody to inlay that if you don't have the skill set. Put that out on YouTube. All of a sudden, we are in a visual world. You guys have to understand that you're doctors in a sense too. 
your audio and visual therapy in a world that greatly needs it. You know what your job really is? Is to hit this right here. Every person, I don't care how uneducated they are, I don't care where they come from, they got a buttoned up A&R executive inside of them and it's called their heart. Yeah. And when you move them <laughs> with your music, when you move them, then they become fanatical over you. They want to buy you. They want to go see you. They want to buy your merch. They want to follow. That's it. It's that simple and that hard. So in your music, in your video, everything you do, you're looking for that movement. When you can move me, you've done something. You know, Paige King Johnson, one of my clients, charted top 30 record on the last one. We got one that's moving up the chart. We will tell you right now, we just got some of the biggest playlists for her. She's an independent right now. But she's staying with it. She's working, working, working every day. She's probably on here today watching me, you know. But she's doing the work. You got to get up and be present. You have to be authentic. You got to be focused. You have to have integrity. You have to take care of your body. It's part of the, it's part of the ritual here, guys. This is not a job, guys. This is a lifestyle. And it's not right for everybody. And that's okay. You can still keep music on the weekend and have fun and have your little band. But if you want to pursue this in a bigger role as far as being a commercial artist out in the world, you know, if that's your dream, then it is a lifestyle and you have to eat, breathe, and sleep it. Yes. Hi, I'm Daniel. Uh, thanks for speaking with us today. Um, I want to touch, uh, I want to go back to something that you touched a bit about before. Um, I make electronic music, mm -hmm. and just a huge part of that is sampling and remix culture. And I was just wondering, uh, what has your experience been like with sampling, um, and how has the industry navigated it today? Okay, you're going to have to have I have rock and roll hearing. I didn't quite get all he of that. He wants to uh, <laughs> know our experiences with sampling. As a customer, he does electronic uh, music. Right. And, uh, yeah. Right, uh, sampling Beach, and remixing. Are you going on Beach Stars at all? Are you, yes. Are you using Beach Stars? Yes. Okay. And if you look at the uh, the whole thing that uh, 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 Nash X and Billy Ray did, that started Old Town Road. Beach Stars groove. So exactly. They took that. It went, it went ballistic on TikTok. Exactly. Next thing you know, led to a major deal. So I, I think it's a very valid thing to do, especially when you have limited resources, if that's the case, right. to build the foundation of those tracks, put the other ingredients around, make it your own, right. and you're buying the license off BeatStars to utilize that. So it's right. completely legitimate. I'd get all over it. My uh, a follow-up to that, specifically with that song in BeatStars, is that uh, I actually read somewhere that that was originally an uncleared sample, so I was wondering, as independent artists, like weighing the pros and cons of sampling other music, and okay, where you stand with that. Help me. I'm still um, pros and cons as an independent artist on sampling. Well, it depends on how much you're going to the usage is going to be, because then you're going to be commanded to pay a royalty on it. Right. Okay, and that could lead to having somebody like this contact you, this mm. gentleman right here, depending right. on the usage of it. You know. Right. Right. You know, so right. you got you got to be careful. Right. If you're pulling from something that's a well-known song, that it can they can pick up on that. Right. There 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 are, there are platforms that can pick up on that right now. Look at what Facebook's doing. You use any th type of a cover song right now, they're going to shut you down, even if you're doing it live. Right. You might get away with it f for a while. Yeah. But all of a sudden, that algorithm is going to be called on to you. And next thing you know, anytime you do anything, they're going to be watching you like a hawk, and that's where we have Facebook jail for people. Yeah, yeah. You say I so. Heard, you have to be careful. I also heard an interesting take on that too. Is that like the original producer of that song was unknown, but he blew up because of the controversy the of that the, sample. The, the, they were unknown uh, before the, the samples you're using. Yeah. Well, the sample I believe I think was Nine Inch Nails, but the producer that did it was like I think like a 20 year old kid. Okay. Yeah, um, but he sampled it just on, like, Fruity Loops. Um, he didn't, like, have the resources to contact Trent Reznor to sample right. it for Old Town Road. Yeah. Um, but I was just wondering if you had experience with other artists that do sampling. I have one right now, and it's actually a little bit of a problem in the fact that uh, it was a Beach Stars thing, and then they, they wanted the first right of release on it. And the producer says, I can't give you that because the producer that we used, the co-producer, was in London, and that, that beat has been readily available on Beat Stars even before our artist got to it. Hmm. And our artist is putting it out 
in a big way with lots of money behind it. And it's a problem because they're not given. So we have a stalemate. I was dealing with that today, part of my job. Oh, wow. Dealing with it. It's a problem. Wow. You know, and I understand both sides of the equation. And there were some mistakes made, but this is, um, it can be a problem unless you have all the lines laid out on the front end. You know, if you're sampling for somebody, you have the ability to contact them, contact, try to negotiate. Right. I'd like to use 15 seconds here. What does that mean? Do you need to be brought in on the publishing for that? What does that mean? Right. Like when you look at um, Kid Rock, he uses a couple major samples in it. Uh, Sweet Home Alabama, remember that? Yeah. That, he that riff that. was in there. He, yeah. Then he just he decided to bring Gary Rosenden in, the real uh, guitar player from Leonard Skinner. But he also had uh, uh, Under Pressure from David Bowie in it. Boom, 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 but a dome, boom. Boom, boom. So Wait. when you look at the publishing split, you got all the writers from the David Bowie song, all the writers from... Le That's the way he solved the problem. Right. There's probably 30 writers on that song, but it enabled him to put it out. Nobody frowned upon that because everybody was included in the ownership of the intellectual property. See how that works? Right. So well, it's I, a, can I can jump in with you. There uh, you are. Andy, you uh, you <laughs> yeah, Andy, great. Andy is one of my clients I manage. He's a triple threat producer. Uh, he is, he's as good as he gets as an artist. So Andy, what do you have to say about that? Well, no, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I work heavily in the kind of electronic music and pop world, but, uh, and sometimes in my workflow, utilize and kind of leverage the beat stars platform and that whole model, because for one, it's, it's something where you could be maybe working with an artist and have them top line on something and get an idea going. And then when you can, you can, you know, interpolate the idea and bring it to life in a new way um, as a track. And you've still got your top line that you were able to get further along with a little bit quicker utilizing that platform. And to Bernard's point, you know, yeah, there can be issues if there are people involved with the, the track at the end of the day that don't understand that there have to be royalties, you know, separated out between the, the producers of the original track if you decide to use it. So it does get sticky, but BeatStars has come a long way. They've got their publishing division now. Um, and a lot of it came and was birthed out of that little Nas X mass, you know, massive explosion. And then you see people like, you know, Nine Inch Nails coming in. They're not, they're not upset about that at all. He goes, right. he's going to wait for that song to blow up and come in and, and command his, his fee and he's going to get it. So everyone wins and he, he has a song that's 10, 20 years old. that's having this new life now. So it's a beautiful evolution as long as it's used properly and everyone understands the rights, the royalties, and, and the way things are, are licensed on the platform. So it's one that I use, not always, but sometimes. And, you know, it can get tricky, but if you pay attention, it can be great. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you. And yeah. Andy, Andy is as good as it gets, guys. I put this guy you just saw up as producer, anybody in the world at any level. He is just waiting for his moment, and it's coming. All right, Reese, what you got from uh, Zoom? Yeah, this is from uh, YouTube. This is from David Searing. He says, how do you find an investor to invest in your project? Okay. Well, what I, what I recommend to people is it could be right in front of you. And I would, I would remove the word investor, and I would add the word sponsor, you know. And it could be um, – but here is the profile of that. You've got to be very careful. If it's somebody that's investing you and their only agenda is they think that they're seeing big dollar signs, run. It has to be in this sequence. Number one, it has to be because they care about you and they want, they, they want to help you. And they can afford to lose the money without affecting their life one second. Because it is a high-risk investment. Yeah, it's very high risk. Number two, you set up the deal so in the, in the chance that you do make money, they're going to be compensated properly. That's it. If it's any other way, and, do and not usually do that it. is where the investor or sponsor gets recouped, you know, first out. Yeah, it can be whatever point. you whatever get somebody that. like this guy to help you put it together. It can be whatever two people agree on it. We have a lot of clients that have investors. I deal with a lot of high net uh, worth people that are into this, but it, it's kind of they look at that in their five percent of their portfolio that they're investing in high technology, high-risk, entertainment businesses. And if you can find somebody like that in your life, or it could be an uncle or an aunt, but sometimes we're not talking about uh, lots of money. Michael Ray, who you know, who's on Warner Brothers Record, was in my program. And I remember it's one of the scariest moments I ever had because I went to Orlando and I met with this guy who I thought was a big orange uh, uh, 
producer, and I think he's really in the mafia is what I think he was, but it was, it was very cinematic for me, and um, my wife went with me, but uh, he, he... And she's still here. Yeah, she, yes. she actually had nightmares <laughs> about that. Uh huh. Okay. So we pull up. That we 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 go through miles and miles and miles. He sent a limo to pick us up, and of just orange grove and the aroma of oranges. I'll never forget. They're, you're just in the car, like wow, it's incredible. We pull up on this estate. First thing I see is helicopters, Ferraris out, and I mean he was he was he was what do they call it when they're they're posturing that? I mean he was definitely trying to impress me. Flexing is the new word. Thank you, my wife. I'm proud of you, honey. So we go back, and his maid takes me back to the back pool house, and Molly's with me, and, and, and one of my assistants at the time was with me too. And he comes out, and he doesn't make any eye contact with anybody at the table but me. And he brings a bottle of vodka, and he's not losing sight on me. He puts that bottle of vodka on that table. He puts the two glasses down. He pours it in the glass. And he says, Bernard, I give you $1 million. And when I give you that million dollars, and he, he moved that glass toward me like that. And we're talking about Michael Ray, who's recording, his num just had a number one record. He said, you responsible. Do you understand me? And I said, may I? He said, please. I said, this million dollars? He goes, yep, and this is the glass of vodka. I said, it's like going to Vegas, baby. And if you don't understand that, let's just have our drinks and be friends. He said, ha, 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 but aren't you funny? I like you, Bernard. You're, you're honest. I said, number one, we don't need a million dollars. I said, Michael needs to go in and cut three songs. He's got the pizzazz. Get out in there and work his butt off. We're not going to make it easy on him. And Michael Ray's sitting right there. And look at him. He got signed to Warner Brothers. He's had two number one records. Does it happen like that all the time? No. But you have to be careful about who you get involved with. That guy ended up not being involved with Michael, and thankfully so. Um, not that he was rude to us in any way, but I don't really know where his money was coming from. And, you know, that's another part. Of it. You can be guilty by association with someone. So even when someone's investing in you, where's that coming from exactly? You know, you're entitled to know that. You know, you don't want to be caught up in anything that could go, that could go wrong. And I could tell you stories like this over and over and over and over again. I need to write a book about it, but I don't think anybody would believe it all. If I had a nickel for every time a, a pretty woman artist was having an investor, yeah. um, if I had a nickel, I would be. Yeah, and what is the expectation well of that? Now. I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, when you, well, well, you got to yeah, get down and, to and, it. And, that's and a, then no. all of a sudden, if, uh, if she's not, uh, and, and you can smell it from a mile away, yeah. and, and, and you're struggling because someone's throwing money out, and yet at the same time, you just have to tell her this is not going to be good. It's not going to end well. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid to call it. Even at your young ages and your inexperience, you still have a mind and a brain. Yeah. Be frank with people. Don't, yeah. don't, don't mess around. Move on. If it ain't going to work for you, just move it out of the way. God's got something else coming. Yeah. Reese, what else you got? We've got our record labels and talent buyers looking at something different from artists post-pandemic versus pre-pandemic. Okay, can you just repeat that one more uh, time yeah. a little bit louder? Our record labels and talent buyers looking at something different from artists post-pandemic versus pre-pandemic. So are, are we looking for different types of talent, creativity? Well, they absolutely are. I mean, at, right after COVID, really the mid-level artists and the, uh, uh, the emerging artists were kind of left out because they were just focusing on how can they make up for what they lost because they took a beating, being, you know, and only the strong survived. They had to change the, the way they thought about things. So it was very difficult on the mid-level and emerging artists in the beginning. Um, and when you look at the talent buying season like the IAFE in Las Vegas, you know, a lot of the fairs and festivals, are 70% of them are booked in the month of December. A lot of people don't know that. You know, and what is left of that 30% is done over the everybody scrambling for that the rest of the year. So it definitely changed. I think we're coming out of that now a little bit. I think it's opening up a lot as far as other artists being able to go out there and repackage themselves in tours and that type of thing. But we definitely were impacted from it. The promoters, uh, I, I have a dear friend of mine is the number three promoter in the world, very worried about him at that time. But luckily he had planned for that, that two years of not having any income and keeping his staff supported. As far as the talent buyers, uh, the same kind of thing. I think they're, they're being a lot more cautious 
you know, there's a subscription called Polestar you should look into. It's a talent buyer's directory. And it gives you, it's the, it's the touring uh, digest of the industry. And, you, and they can really research and see the history of an artist, whether or not they're selling or not, even at club level. So if you're not out there putting butts in seats, they're probably going to be a little reluctant to pay you anything until you prove yourself. So people have become a lot more cautious in that world on both sides. Uh, yes, go ahead, Reese. Oh, there's another one. No, oh, great, please. Oh, uh, one is <clears throat> regarding the importance of social media. What happened with the dispute between Halsey and Capitol Records? Was it a disagreement in the contract regarding social media streams? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, there, there's a lot more to uh, to that uh, from a from a legal standpoint, uh, without getting into uh, certain aspects of contract law. But um, and I don't know how familiar are you with this uh, this case, the Halsey uh, case. Are you familiar at all with it? Um, it's from the sexual harassment yes, side of uh, things, yeah. uh, vaguely. Yeah. So. Without getting into uh, that aspect of it, my guess is, and this is the guess because I've never seen the contract, but my guess is that there was a contractual provision in there that are typically like moral clauses and things like that, that somewhere, um, depending on how that's negotiated, because that uh, is negotiated on one end in a very absolute way, like you have to have a conviction, this, that, or where they usually land now is something that causes uh, damage to reputation or holds the label or someone in an in a, uh, ill light. Um, and my guess is that that is what probably got triggered and went from there. But without seeing the contract and what is... The only last thing I'll just say is the social media provision in a contract is just as negotiated now these days as... I mean, it used to be... I don't know, uh, three to five years ago, it was tell the talent that you'll promote everything in social media. Now, when I see a social media uh, provision, it's got all these different elements of what you can or can't do, what you shouldn't be doing. Um, and it's important because now it is the medium where if someone is either holding someone in a bad light or promoting something before it's ready, it it has a major impact. So, uh, I th yeah, and I think it's a good time to talk about this. You know, words can ruin your career. One word can ruin your career. You know, taking the wrong. Don't get into politics. If you I'm, you you got a political opinion, I'm happy for you. Keep it to yourself. Stick to your music. In this day and time, you can lose half your audience by saying the wrong thing or taking a side. You know, that's a personal perspective. You don't need to do that. Okay, unless you're prepared to go to the wall with it, you better be studied, you know, because you're going to get attention when you do it. But that's not the kind of attention you want. Dolly Parton is the master. Go watch her videos when they try to move her off course. And she'll say, I'm here to talk about my album. I have my political opinion, but that's my own opinion. Now, we're going to talk about my record right now as she smiles. You see? So very important. We're always remember that guy. Stay in your lane. Dolly's an angel on earth. So, but anyway, um, this question is for Kirk. At what stage in an emerging artist's career should he or she initially engage counseling and legal representation in the from an entertainment attorney? You should see somebody like Kirk when you have an offer, when you have a contractual piece of paper in front of you, or you know it's coming. Then it's time to shop for someone like yourself. You'll be in good shape. And their job is to guide, consult, and protect you. Well, and the, there were uh, two aspects of that. One is protecting your music. That's, uh, and that's fairly easy. And, and I get calls like that all the time and just tell people. But here's a, a trick that you have to be careful of with labels or so-called labels or whatever it is. Usually what they'll do is they will get the artist to agree on key terms without the lawyer. In other words, it's a, you know, like, and then when it comes to me, they go, well, your, your client agreed to this, you know, you can't undo what's already been agreed, so there's a, a got you. So I would say that um, if you're going to come see me 
when you're getting an offer, make clear that you have not agreed to anything and you're not stuck on something. Um, and that's everything, and things you don't even realize, like a control composition clause that could kill your, your music publishing revenue. Um, when that number is really high, you're not going to get Correct. any, you're not going to get any money from that. And they, they, got, they gave you a term sheet or something and I'm talking with a, a lawyer and they said, your client agreed to this and I'm having to try to undo it and it's not easy. Yeah. So in the, in the world of digital assets, uh, what's your experience with NFTs and digital currency and how do artists who are not signed on with any major deal take advantage of that ecosystem? Uh, are you in NFTs from no. a business standpoint? No. We did one with a client. I, I was involved. I, but yeah, I, I've been uh, involved in and I've actually spoken on uh, panels with it. Um, a, a, a couple things. Assuming that there's content worth it, right? right? I mean, now I think Madonna now is doing an NFT. Yeah, I read that. Uh, yeah. um, and Anthony Hopkins has a movie now that's an NFT. So, um, you know, the... And, and it's still like the, uh, the tulip uh, industry in the Netherlands that busted. People don't know if it's going to bust or not eventually. But one, if you have some content, then there are professionals, and I, I have dealt with them, that are very good at, at marketing NFTs and just trying to get a market out there. The problem is I think that market is starting to get you know, saturated, and it's saturated at a point where now branding is important in an NFT rather than seeing some drawing of something that just moves you and you're going to spend a million dollars mm -hmm. on it. The fad aspect is gone. Um, from a legal standpoint, the big issue is the blockchain contract and whether or not you, when it gets resold or gets you know, passed on, and I'm using those terms lightly, whether you will get paid in that. So that is the key economic aspect. It's not just the initial sale, but what happens when it's out in the, in the blockchain uh, universe. So it, I, I don't know if it's, if it's still a fad or not, uh, but in many respects, it's understanding that there's still a royalty stream there if the content is there. I don't know that unless there's something really unique, you're going to get these big dollar amounts that you were hearing about in the beginning. Um, but I think that's where the major artists are coming in now and trying to, you know, again, Madonna, it's got one mm -hmm. now, an NFT, as if that medium somehow is going to open new doors for her. But I think it's the novelty of it. That's my opinion of it. Uh, that's just my opinion of it. Um, Anthony Hopkins, I just saw a movie that he's got there. So, again, it's can you monetize it after the initial sale? And, and most mm -hmm. of the documents, agreements are around that and how that will get into your digital wallet. Bernard, I think this one is for you. How do upcoming artists that have families and children factor into decisions on signing an artist? Is that ever a factor when... An artist the, that wants to pursue this with children? With, with a family. Okay. Does that ever come into consideration? You know, all the time. Should we call Molly up for this? Uh, well, yeah. No, Molly can, she, she can definitely answer it. Uh -huh. She's as good as me. But um, um, I think it needs to be a consideration from the lifestyle perspective. Um, um, my wife was actually in that position. My wife is an amazing artist. Look her up. Molly Porter. We, we have a ministry with her. She's got several videos. We shot the last video, video in Malibu, and it's, it's literally changed lives. I mean, there, there are stories from that. And that was all about a, 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 a supernatural thing that happened in our life where God, uh, our creator, and I give him praise. And that's another big part we need to talk about, guys. You need to have that in your life. That's a guiding light. I mean, that's everything right there, where God actually performed a miracle on Molly in the operating room and healed her. And it's, it's, it's documented, you know. And uh, so we decided to pay tribute to God by doing a video called Safe because God kept telling us, I was worried, you know, I was getting the right doctors, the right team, the right hospital, and 
God kept telling me, she's going to be safe. She's going to be safe. I, hadn't, I thought that meant we had the right medical team. I thought we had the right procedure. I thought that their healing wasn't going to go well. And she's a higher angel. Anybody knows her, you know that about her. I didn't know that the, the surgeon was going to call me into the surgery room and say, I can't explain. I'm talking about he's in the wrap. She's under, you know. And he said, I can't explain this, Mr. Porter. He said, Molly, raise your hand, because she couldn't even lift her arm before that, and she lifted her hand. And, and he, she went through several things, and her strength was back. He said, there's no clinical explanation for this. I said, is it a miracle? He said, it could be. And I'm looking around at the nurses, and they're like crying. They see stuff like this all the time. So that is so important to know that that exists in your world. You need to focus on that. You need to be piano. You know what your job really is in addition to being audio and visual therapy is to use the gifts. Here it is. Here it is. Listen carefully. Use the gifts that you have to go out and change the world. Just like Carlos is. Just like Reese is. What they're doing in their ministry with changing this area is remarkable. Get in there with them. The creator is all about mathematics. You know that, Kurt? Absolutely. Everything. Your posturing well, and doing that will bring blessing, the right people, the right opportunity, the right door open, and you get credit every time you do something great. Yeah. I promise you. Mark Take it down. care of your family. That's uh, Absolutely. bottom line yeah. to the answer. All right, we are well past our time, so those that That's have uh, stayed, uh, <laughs> those that have stayed with us on Zoom, we uh, thank you, the audience. Let we me make one other you. plug for more information. We're always looking for that top 5% in the world. It's pcgartistdevelopment.com. You can get to everything you need to know from that portal. And uh, we have a theatrical division run by the great Tony Vincent, one of the top Broadway guys in the world, pcgtheatrical.com. You can see it there. Uh, PCGDigitalMediaOnline.com. So a lot to, lot to look at. And I'm going to look to my right, and I'm going to say thank you, Carlos, and in your studios. Thank you, Reese, for all of y'all's wonderful uh, kindness and everything. We hope we, uh, we behaved uh, tonight. Uh, in your ears, a great uh, studio. I hope uh, those of you that ever consider recording that you, you come here. Carlos and his team are just uh, out, outstanding. So um, Carlos, you coming in? You want to say a, a, a final word or? I can. Please. You want me to do that? Uh, sure. We'll turn it all over to Carlos. It is now. appropriate. Thank you, Carlos. Gosh. It's, uh, it's hard to follow up uh, intelligence, smarts, uh, charisma. Uh, this kind of knowledge is, is, is what it's all about. This is what will lift you up and get you going to the next level. It's what will make it worth it. And, uh, you know, we want to do more of this. We want to bring more of this to this community, but not just this community. It's just great to share it, too. I mean, this YouTube thing and everything, we had a lot of people on. There's been a lot of questions, a lot of things, a lot of people watching. So I want to thank both of you guys. Kurt, awesome job putting this together. Thanks for the phone yeah. call and the yeah. idea. Thanks for our awesome. friendship. Awesome. Bernard, just thank incredible. Thank you for having me. Good to see you again. Tom. Really good job. I think you've enlightened a lot of us with uh, your stories and so forth. I know it would take many of these to get even a portion of those stories out and into You're the world. To say so I'm I think you one. need to start on the book. <laughs> I think they need to get that going. Molly, make sure you didn't put anything in there that we don't want to read, okay? <laughs> there are probably some things that will have to wait until some people die. <laughs> right, right, That's right. True. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I've been a part of a lot of those kind of things. <laughs> but. Uh, but at any rate, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for supporting this. Please spread the word. This is up on YouTube. It's going to be there. Share it. Make sure people uh, you know, get in the dialogue and, and talk about this stuff. Uh, my feeling is, we didn't talk a lot about this tonight, but my feeling is that after COVID and after many of the things that have happened in the record business, it is time for a major disruption to happen. I feel it coming. It's like an earthquake. I think something's going to happen. Here's why. We mentioned tonight that the record companies and a lot of people have had to make up during COVID for people for not making money. They've had to make money. So they've come out, and they're pushing up all their stars. They're trying to milk all those things that they've been doing to try to get that money back. 
and they have ignored, ignored for several years some of the most talented people out there just waiting to break through. This is being ignored right now. It is the time, it is the time right now for those people to stand up and go, hey, it's me. I got it. You need to listen up and you need to, and you need to check me out because I got something to say and I'm ready to bring it. Remember so there you go. So thanks thank you, a lot. Th and thank you, audience. Thank you, That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good.